what really got me interested in cross-chain stuff was like seeing atomic swaps and that we had known how to do these for most of a decade and that no one was actually using them. Um, so uh, we started off at SUMA back in 2017 building out cross-chain atomic swaps and uh, more complex financial instruments like derivatives based on atomic swaps. Uh, we kind of pivoted away from that and more into the SPV territory and you know, middle of 2018. Um, SPV is uh, a little bit more expensive, but extremely versatile, and it enables a lot of the cool stuff we've done, like cross-chain Dutch auctions and uh, TBTC. Um, those are things that you can't do effectively with atomic swaps, but are fairly easy with SPV. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, and uh, basically, like with the systems that you guys have built so far, um, where are you guys at? Uh, just just so we get a good sense, and uh, um, where are you guys at in the process? Like, have you guys launched? Um, you know, for everyone uh, in the room today, just just to have a good sense of where you guys are uh, with the different projects, with Atomic Loans, with TBBC, and then uh, the quality as well. Uh, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, so essentially for, for atomic loans. Um, so we, we launched, um, so we had our private, um, private, uh, our private alpha actually back in the fall, um, where we allowed people to, you know, kind of go on and, and test it using an access code and, uh, really got a lot of feedback from that and, and it kind of improved the protocol. Um, and so we had our, our private mainnet beta, um, just early, um, uh, early January, February, um, and, and just recently actually launched, uh, borrowing to, to the public. Um, so anyone can go on, uh, and they can take their Ledger Nano and they can go in and get access to a Bitcoin back loan. Um, the lending side is currently still closed um, just because it is, uh, there is a little bit more of a, a process uh, on the lending side, uh, but we're working on uh, enabling that to, to open that up to the public soon as well. Cool. James? Uh, so we have a bunch of different irons in the fire. Um, we're primarily a consulting company right now. So our Cosmos Relay is uh, in beta stage. We have a live cello Bitcoin relay. Um, TBTC, which is a partnership between us and Keith, is launching on, I think, Monday, uh, sometime next week. I'm not in charge of the deploy process. Um, let's see. We went mainnet with the HTLC-based atomic swap contracts in 2018, early 2018, and mainnet with the SPV auctions in late 2018. Um, so we have a bunch of like different products and different stages um, on different chains. Awesome, Alex. Yeah, so I've um, spent a lot of time on the development uh, towards in 2017 through 2018. Uh, went live in production uh, towards the end of 2018, uh, where two parties could anonymously swap these assets uh, between each other. Um, and I believe, yeah, towards the beginning or end of last year, uh, we've gone live with kind of a wallet automator function. That's one of the uh, tricks with atomic swaps, uh, as opposed to normal transactions, is it is a multi-step process that needs to happen within that transaction. And uh, one of the areas that we went live with at the end of 2018 uh, was that these two manual parties could actually transact with each other. Uh, and the part that we've gone live with now is where that party can actually have an, a wallet automator acting on their behalf to uh, go through. And both of those are running on mainnet at the moment. Awesome. Sounds like great progress from, from all of you guys. Um, so now that we got that out of the way, um, let's get a bit deeper into some of the nitty gritty stuff and like uh, kind of like go into a bit of a compare and contrast um, between the different systems, some of the design design decisions and uh, things like that that you guys considered. Um, so I would like to kind of hear about like, uh, you know, why you guys built the systems the way you did in terms of like for in terms of TBDC, uh, obviously creating a tokenized ERC-20 version of, Bit, uh, version of Bitcoin. Um, and then like what are some of the design uh, trade-offs that you considered? Um, uh, in when you guys were designing your 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 guys's protocol, um, yeah, maybe start from there, James. Um, so uh, you know, the reason that we stopped building uh, atomic swaps back in 2018 is that uh, you have this problem where you need rounds of off-chain communication. Uh, 
So you need to actually like introduce two clients to each other and have them make some sort of network connection to each other or a shared server. And uh, I didn't really like that. It makes for a really bad user experience. And then after that, you need to have people stay online for hours until the trade resolves. Uh, Liquality is doing a lot to address this with their automation here. Um, but it's another like bad user experience is you have to stay online or you have to have some agent staying online on your behalf or you risk losing funds. Uh, so we pivoted into the SPV based technology to try to resolve those problems. And so TBTC doesn't require communication between any clients except what's done on chain. Um, and the same goes for the SPV based swaps. Uh, you don't have to negotiate, you don't have to make a connection to some other node, you just have to read the chain and uh, make decisions based on it. That's the main uh, like concern for us. Gotcha. Are there any limitations of the SPV system? Um, it's a little more expensive and you have to have a lot more knowledge about uh, Bitcoin's consensus mechanism. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's only one-way communication, so Ethereum can read Bitcoin, Bitcoin can't read Ethereum. So you have to structure your protocols to be kind of asymmetric there, uh, whereas HTLCs, you can be nice and symmetric in a lot of ways. Um, and it's very like limited in what chains you can use. Bitcoin is really the only like target here. You can't do uh, SPVs of Ethereum because ETH hash is uh, terrible. Um, and you can't do Litecoin or Monero or Zcash for the same reason. It's basically only between ETH and Bitcoin. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, cool. And then, uh, Matt, uh, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, why did you de decide, um, uh, I guess Matt and Alex, why did you guys decide to kind of, uh, build out a system that utilizes kind of native Bitcoin and native Ethereum and then kind of like, what were the design trade-offs that you guys considered, uh, when you guys were designing the system? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can go first. So essentially, like kind of for us, it was, um, uh, you know, we wanted to use, um, I, I guess, a system like Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself, like we all know is, is difficult to work with the, you know, the functionality of the, of the, um, uh, Bitcoin scripts is is quite limited. Um, however, like kind of, uh, you know, for us, like kind of building a, a debt system, um, uh, you know, kind of the idea of being able to, uh, you know, Bitcoin scripts allows for you to basically lock your Bitcoin into a specific location and then unlock it at a different period. And for the most part, that's either going to be a multi-sig or a hash time lock contract with an atomic swap. Um, uh, for our case, that's basically used as collateral. Um, and so we kind of, uh, you know, looked at, uh, you know, for myself, like previously working on kind of what LaQuality was doing, we looked at kind of the concept of like, well, here's what you can do with an HTLC and here's what the unlocking process looks like. What if this could be extended to allow um, for the creation of a debt, uh, a, a debt instrument? Um, and so that was kind of the basis of, of atomic loans. Obviously, there's like um, some trade offs with that. Um, uh, you know, number one is like you need, you know, you need to, it's, um, you need to, you can only like lock the Bitcoin and then unlock it. So it's, you know, it's kind of, it's very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's very rigid, I would say in terms of, uh, in, in comparison to like existing like Ethereum, uh, like DeFi ecosystem projects where you can, you know, easily, you know, add more collateral, remove collateral all over the place. Um, whereas something like this, it's very easy to lock it, but then doing something afterwards is, is a bit harder. Um, but the advantages that bring that comes with that is uh, in terms of like the surface area for attack, um, you know, since you're locking that Bitcoin on the, 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 the mainnet Bitcoin chain itself, I mean, you know, Bitcoin script hacks are, uh, <laughs> are pretty, uh, pretty unheard of. Um, and so, and so that was kind of one, one big thing for us was to reduce kind of like the service area for attack when you're, um, when you're locking collateral. Cool. Alex, anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, um, Bitcoin has its moments, but I think one of one of its distinctive features is the simplicity in how the transaction system works, where it's based off of predicates. I mean, you're going to end up with a true or a false. In the event of a true, you can spend. In the event of a false, you can't. And I think in terms of uh, applying that as your lowest common denominator, um, finding a very similar execution pattern to execute on more complex systems like the EVM uh, and to reduce it down to that simple factor helps you also reduce the amount of error you might have in the system. And um, I, th I think uh, one of the points that James raised is the interactivity problem, which we're very much well aware of. Um, 
but to a, a certain level of degree, there's also implicit interactivity required, even in the normal usage of some of these functions. If, if, we, if we take a Bitcoin transaction, um, it's generally the responsibility of the receiver to do the verification of inclusion. So even in terms of receiving a transaction, if I had to send Bitcoin from me to yourself, you would have to be online for the duration of the time that you feel comfortable with a transaction actually having been verified. Um, and in terms of the hash time lock contracts, um, albeit that you sit with this free option problem, uh, sometimes the theory versus the practice seems to prove quite definitely, and we've taken quite a long bet on using the BUP199 hash time lock contract, uh, developing that as like ERC1630, which is the compatible uh, implementation of that predicate on Ethereum, and then putting it to test in actually seeing how many users take up these free option problems. And then also just trying to uh, overcome these issues with interactivity, which we, I think we're making some strides on. Uh, but there are some trade-offs in this process and it is something we need to work through uh, and optimize. Yeah, um, I think the really like interesting thing about interactivity is uh, like how much exogenous data do the participants need to insert into the protocol, right? With HTLCs, the thing that really got me was the initial like key, like pub key exchange step. Uh, you need to find some trading partner on some venue, you need to establish a connection and you need to exchange information before we can even like start the protocol. So the setup is complex and can't rely on a chain. Um, the kind of ideal for a lot of these systems is that we use only information which is endogenous to the chain, like uh, that we don't have any out of band communication uh, protocol, right? Uh, so that the only thing that we're doing in terms of communication is reading from the chain. Gotcha. And I just noticed that uh, uh, Long from uh, Ren has just joined us. Um, uh, Long, why don't you uh, why don't you like uh, give a brief intro about uh, about Ren? And then uh, we were just uh, talking about you know why why did you d uh, build the system um, the way that you did? And then kind of what were some of the design trade offs that uh, you considered? Yeah, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, sorry, I'm late, guys. Uh, I think the rest of the speeches were delayed a little bit, so I, I had assumed that that was the case with this one as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with uh, RenVM, we really wanted to focus on a universal interoperability protocol, so something that could cater to any kind of application, whether it exists now or it exists in the future. Um, you know, I, I think there, there is a trade-off that's made when you have a specialized protocol. You know, when you have a specialized protocol, you can you can look to specialize it. You can look to make it the best at what it does for that specific purpose. But then every time a new application comes around, you have to rethink and redesign a new system. Um, and you know, we moved away from atomic swaps quite a while ago because I mean, we implemented them, we deployed them, and we just found that in practice, it was actually very hard um, to to get things right. Uh, and I think James touched on. Uh, you know, the need to exchange these secrets ahead of time. And that was actually quite a painful process. And doing that in a way, like even if you created a separate protocol specifically for that, it, to try and keep it decentralized and, and, you know, create a new network so you can claim that this is done on chain um, was painful. And, and it doesn't make any sense uh, to create an entire network just to exchange those secrets. Um, and I think the lack of generality was really what, what hit us. So uh, the way that we've designed RenVM has kind of centered around this focus for uh, being able to use a single transaction to bounce uh, your intent or the, the thing that you want to do through as many different platforms, as many different chains and as many different assets as you can, uh, but just with, with the one transaction. And I think, you know, when you want to talk about whether it's loaning or exchanging or what have you, you can do this with a general system. Um, and of course, you're, you're just making a slight trade-off as to maybe the efficiency of that system. Awesome. Thanks, Long. Um, cool. That that makes sense. And um, moving moving on to the next question, um, one of the uh, biggest things that come to mind uh, when uh, people talk about uh, kind of trust, just different forms of trustless tokenized 
uh, Bitcoin or other assets uh, on Ethereum uh, are the scalability challenges. Um, and uh, and uh, Long and, and, and James, I, I guess this is a question more directed at, at you guys. Um, how do you guys plan on addressing some of these uh, uh, issues or concerns moving forward? How are you guys tackling uh, this moving forward? Um, scalability challenges for Ethereum? Um, scalability challenges in terms of, uh, sorry, capital efficiency. Um, sorry, I should have specified uh, in terms of, you know, the, the need to collateralize another asset to back uh, the, the actual bit, uh, Bitcoin or, or some other asset that you're, uh, you're minting there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, anytime we try to make a decentralized protocol, we're going to have terrible capital efficiency problems. Um, in real life, you know, you get a loan and you only have to put a tiny fraction down uh, because it's collateralized by their ability to sue you and to uh, seize your house if it's a mortgage or seize your car or seize your other assets or garnish your wages or whatever. Um, on chain, we don't have that legal recourse the same way. And so that's why you see on chain loans being over collateralized by a fairly significant amount is because if they ever become under collateralized, there's the chance that you're going to just walk away with the funds. Um, I think that there's a lot we can do to mitigate that, but it's going to take a few years to figure out like what the right mitigations are. Um, we commonly use like uh, trusted price feeds right now, and we have an over collateralization margin that's just like some guy blindfolded himself and threw a dart at a board to reach 1.5. Uh, I think what we're going to see is a lot of systems experimenting with this and figuring out what the right collateralization ratio is and how to calculate it from relative volatilities of different assets. But uh, I don't know what that's going to be. For sure. Yeah, definitely early days and still lots to figure out. Uh, Long, on your side? Yeah, I mean, I think I would echo a lot of what James said. I think at this stage, we don't have any other way of doing it other than to over collateralize. Um, and I think with interoperability protocols, it's actually a even more complex problem because if you think about a standard over collateralization where you've got something, let's say, let's take make it out as an example, you have DAI. So you have 150% over collateralization of some collateral and then you get a synthetic essentially out on the other end. If you think about an interoperability protocol, you have that exact same setup, but you also have the actual real redeemable collateral hooked in, which can be stolen. And that collateral can't be stolen in like a make it out system because it's in a contract. You can't just like thieve it out from underneath the system, which is something you can do in an, in, in an interoperability protocol in, in a general form. And this is, this is where I think systems like atomic swaps do have a distinct advantage um, because again, this collateral can't be stolen or it's much harder to steal it. You have to do complex timing attacks. Um, and I, I think that's, that's kind of the unique spin that it gets, I think forgotten from the common conversation is that yes, you can say, okay, it's like compound or it's like make it out, but it's actually a bit worse. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. Um, and I think we say scalability, we mean capital efficiency. That's well and good. I think there is also actually the problem of more traditional scalability. Um, if you're relying on uh, this over collateralization, often there has to be some way to use that collateralization as recourse. Uh, and we can see that failing when there's network congestion and that becomes quite a, a difficult problem to understand how timing effects come into play and how they can alter the security of your system. Um, maybe it's cheaper for an attacker to attack the system and then cause a huge amount of network congestion for an extended period of time. Uh, and then somehow, you know, subvert your system that way. Um, but I think there's also scalability of the actual interoperability protocol itself especially if you want to start supporting multiple chains, because now you're saying, okay, maybe Ethereum scales up to being able to do hundreds of transactions per second. And maybe you have all these other blockchains that can do that as well. Your interoperability protocol has to now support the sum of all of those throughputs. And so scalability in the more traditional sense is also, I think a key challenge. And I think that gets solved funnily enough in an easier way. You just have to do, you have, just have to advance the maths. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Um, you, you bring up kind of an interesting point is that there's a fundamental difference between uh, atomic swaps, HTLCs, and like the SPV or the like, uh, you know, REN style systems. Um, 
we, we can sort these protocols into essentially forward facing and backward facing, right? Uh, HTLCs are trying to constrain what can possibly happen in the future. And a lot of the TBTC and Ren VM style stuff is trying to verify what has happened and ensure that it is the correct thing by punishing people if something bad happened. Um, the HTLCs, as a result, have a much lower collateral environment. Um, you know, they're constraining what can happen to that collateral, uh, where the backward-facing protocols have to have over-collateralization because things can go wrong. Yeah, I think that's an interesting way of thinking about it, this sort of backwards-looking versus forwards-looking concept. Um, and I, I think actually the sort of systems um, like we have with Ren, they actually kind of have both. They have this problem where they have to see what's happened, but then also try and constrain what can happen in the future. You know, you don't want somebody to be able to spend or redeem Bitcoin without actually burning the tokenized representation of that Bitcoin. Um, and obviously that's, I think that's a forward looking concern. Um, it's important to note that Bitcoin can only do forward looking protocols. Uh, so anything that touches Bitcoin is in some sense going to be forward looking or be a hybrid. Yep. Awesome. I totally agree with that. That makes sense. And, and, and Matt and Alex, like, uh, do you guys have a response to that? Basically, um, you know, on, on the point of the forwards versus backwards looking and the collateralization requirements, like what are you guys' thoughts on that and how does your unique uh, HTLC uh, based approach um, um, kind of uh, play, play with interplay with that? Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting because like, um, you know, as they mentioned, like anything that happens on like, you know, kind of native Bitcoin needs to be forward looking. And, and that obviously means like a, a few different requirements. It means that like you can't, um, you can't do everything on chain, you know, all the data that you need for doing a specific um, transaction or action can't be, can't be included on chain. It means that you need to have some, some off chain um, element that's going to you know, be including the details like the public keys or the secrets that are involved with that, um, which makes it a little tougher and, and uh, a little bit more involved in order to, to build a system like that. Um, uh, in, in terms of like the, um, I mean, the, the collateralization aspect, I think, um, I think, you know, uh, James touched on it really well and that, you know, all these systems, like, I mean, it's the same for us. Like you need, um, in order to build any type of decentralized system, you need over collateralization because, um, you know, <laughs> you know, there's no, no, there's no one to sue at the other end. Um, and so like, um, you know, we, we run into the same kind of issue in, in the collateral requirement of Bitcoin, but um, but I think like the the element of requiring some off chain data um, uh, is is, uh, is is just another layer that uh, that needs to be considered, I guess, when you're looking when you're looking to do it in a forward manner. Alex, yeah, and I think um, yeah, I mean, from a small perspective, like I say, we we try and keep it as simple as uh, as we can um, in terms of. Like, like, like one of the areas I enjoy about Bitcoin quite a bit is you don't have to trust anyone to hold your value. And in the same right, when you're doing a swap, you're not collateralizing, locking up anyone and depending a third, on a third party for that. Anything that you lock up, you're actually locking up as a promise to yourself. And you're setting the terms for the rules uh, for these contracts that you deploy. Um, so yeah, as far as it goes, I mean, even the information sharing to us, we haven't seen as a big issue because essentially any action that even fires off in something like um, the EVM, it needs to be fired off by an external wallet user. A contract cannot just autonomously decide to fire off a transaction unless, uh, unless an event gets triggered on it. Um, so whether or not that's the sharing of the information, I mean, if I ask you to send me Bitcoin, I still need to share my address with you. Uh, the same happens in these swaps. I mean, it's just the additional uh, bit of information that gets added into it, but it doesn't take away the issue that information needs to be shared. Um, it's just the transaction uh, type itself is just another primitive transaction that gets added to the existing list of transaction types you might have in a wallet. So we don't really uh, see it in the same light. 
Yeah, and I think to add to that as well, like I think this is also like kind of a, a question around kind of the philosophies of uh, you know Bitcoin versus Ethereum. I think like you know for for kind of the view of, of Bitcoiners is you know we're going to have uh, you know a small small block size that uh, you know is 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 going to be constrained and it isn't going to you know uh, grow, grow exponentially. Whereas the, the view in Ethereum is you know you can put a bunch of data on chain and that's okay. And so I think these are like it's really interesting. These are two different worlds that are you know constantly competing with each other and uh, and want to be able to work together and so um, you know when you, if I guess if you're taking the approach of like you know the um, like the for, like the forward approach then like data needs to be, be contained off chain and and that's I, I think okay for a lot of bitcoiners whereas uh, kind of the you know, the more ethereum approach or the, the backwards approach is that you know there can be more data that's 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 on chain well I'd also like to extend I mean if we have a look at the browser wars um, to a certain extent, certain browsers actually implemented web standards and other vendors decided to add more, let's say, fancy features, uh, which kind of like gave them appeal to users utilizing those. But if you brought it down to the common denominator, like you don't necessarily need to exploit the most fancy feature of something to get it right. If you can find the lowest common denominator that works across the board and keep it as simple as possible, I just think you reduce the amount of complexity. Um, and essentially uh, won by adopting base standards as opposed to like non-standard things. Awesome. Yeah. Great, great, great point. Creating those standards. those standards for other chains outside of just Bitcoin, um, which may not support the same feature set. Yeah, I, I think it's a good point there. But as far as our requirements go, it requires hash locks and time locks. As long as the chain supports those two primitives, uh, we can provide the BIP199 compatible standards for those chains. And then essentially the contracts are just native wallet transactions um, without trying to add any third party custodial contracts or intermediated contracts or networks into the. the As a side note, you can use um, signature linearity or uh, simple ZKPs to. Uh, have HTLCs that include chains without hash locks or time locks. Hmm. Uh, it, it just adds some complexity to the setup. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Which is like what I said, it's something we'd consider uh, on our side, but we're trying to keep it as simple as we possibly can. Yeah, that's I like mean, a version five feature. It is best, right? I mean, old code is technical debt. Yeah, totally. And it's a similar situation for us too. I mean, like we, we can add other chains. I think it depends. Like um, one thing we've uh, considered is obviously like the work that James has done on, on SPV proofs, I think is, is definitely very interesting for us to be able to they say add, be able to add collateral, for example. Um, whereas like that's kind of a feature that would only work on um, on Bitcoin um, uh, due to the kind of like you know SHA two fifty six like verification uh, limitations. So, um, uh, but you know <laughs> for the foreseeable future, I think uh, I think uh, you know people are bullish on Bitcoin. So uh, we'll see. Um, all code is technical debt. Uh, is anyone here over collateralizing their technical debt? <laughs> <laughs> Over collateralize all the things. <laughs> awesome. So done with auditors. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome guys. Um, so uh, one thing that I wanted to touch on was that um, uh, basically, uh, you know, when, when when whenever it comes to like over collateralization systems, like there's always like you know kind of like the um, you know, price fluctuations that could affect things um, and stuff like that. Like for so, um, I'm I'm curious as to like you know how um, how, how, what, what impacts does like price fluctuations in Bitcoin or price fluctuations in Ren or in Ether affect your guys' system? Um, and then like, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of situations can happen and what, what, what things can go wrong and what things can, or what, what do you guys uh, have in place to kind of prevent things from going wrong as well? I mean, I guess, uh, so like with, with the Ren system, we made the choice of using a dedicated token as the bond. Um, one of the reasons for this is with liquidation mechanisms, uh, which we're trying to avoid, what you ultimately are kind of doing is there's a moment where you essentially preempt an adversary. So you look at this group of people that's providing the collateral and you say, 
you know, it, it might get to a point where you guys would be able to take profit from stealing money out of the system. So let's just assume that you're going to do that soon and we're just going to preempt you and we're going to kind of force you to do that uh, and take away your bond, uh, even if you may have been behaving well. And then we're going to use that to start trying to restore the peg. So we basically, we kind of force you into a position where you're going to steal the underlying Bitcoin. And then we re restore the peg by buying that Bitcoin off, off the, um, the tokenized representation and burning that away. Um, we, we, we wanted to avoid this for a couple of reasons. Um, that preemptive mechanism doesn't allow for a particularly neat recovery if liquidation happens too quickly. For example, if you see a huge drop in the price of your locked asset versus the price of your bond and it goes below uh, 100% or it goes below a margin where uh, you're going to be able to buy back off the open market with the right amount of slippage, it's very difficult to recover from that position. Um, so we take the approach of being even more over collateralized, which obviously has its own disadvantages and trying to instead adjust fees as a way to uh, keep that collateralization threshold the same. And so if you want your bond value to be greater than your locked value, you essentially have three options. One is you force people to bring in more bond. Two is you increase the value of the bond or three is you lower the value of the locked uh, assets. And so we're trying to cater to those, those back two options where by ranking up the fees, you lower the demand for the system and people want to extract their locked assets because they're not willing to pay hundred percent per annum. Um, and you can lower L, but also by doing that, you're naturally increasing the fees generated by the system and you would expect uh, the market to respond by valuing the bond at a slightly higher rate. And so you kind of get this adjustment. Uh, of course, there's latency involved. And so the trade-off there is, um, well, there's two trade-offs. With latency, you need a larger over collateralization margin. And you need to consider this case where you're temporarily under collateralized, which is why you need, I think, more protection against an irrational adversary than you might need with a liquidation mechanism. And the second is that you need a continuous governance mechanism. So you, you need the, uh, a community of nodes that is constantly adjusting the fees or, or able to adjust the fees uh, at any moment. But both of those can be, can be mitigated. Awesome, James, anything, anything you wanted to uh, talk about specifically with uh, the TBTC system? Um, so, you know, the main like problem here is if, uh, TPTC becomes under collateralized if the signers don't have enough ETH to cover the Bitcoin. Um, so TPTC does use a liquidation mechanism, uh, like Long was describing. Um, essentially, like as it approaches that under collateralization uh, threshold, the signers are instructed to close out the deposit. Um, and any individual signer can do that with a positive EV as this is happening. Um, so in practice, it probably looks similar to fee adjustment, right? Is you can close this out with positive EV if you do it yourself. Um, we don't expect a lot of these to go into liquidation. Um, and the defense there is, you know, essentially liquidate while still over collateralized. Um, I think that, you know, we've tried to model this in a way that's very similar to the MakerDAO system. And, uh, we're going to see how it works for TBTC1 v1 and make adjustments going forward. Uh, for the like much less complex SPV swap mechanisms, um, the problem here of like price movement manifests as you getting a bad price on your assets and being uh, and having latency in trade cancellation. So you can see the price moving against you, but you won't necessarily be able to cancel the trade before it does. Um, I think atomic swaps have a very similar problem, but it manifests as free options, uh, which are don't seem to be as bad in practice as they are in theory. But I'll let like someone else talk about those. Speaking uh, speaking of that, you guys, Alex, you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. Like I say, we try and keep it very simple with the swaps. Um, we, we've got a, a strong ethos in ownership over debt. So there's nothing in our actual approach that requires you to deal with uh, kind of like these leveraging or collateralization problems. You pretty much own the contract. Um, you define the rules of those contracts. And I think like James rightfully said, the one drawback with that in particular, and I think it'll become more visible within volatile times, 
is uh, whether or not the initiating party of the swap takes that free option. Uh, in practice so far, we've seen a very little of that happen, uh, but that does not mean that option is not there. Um, but there are various other approaches that uh, kind of the reciprocating party or party B in the swap can take uh, to manage their risk in those particular cases. Um, but yeah, it's pretty simple on our side. The swap happens or it doesn't happen. And how do you mitigate the risk around perhaps the actions you need to take for it going through or not going through? But, yeah. uh, do you have any mitigations for the first funder problem? Um, look, I mean, we can play, play around with times. For example, you typically have got this boilerplate system where you say, okay, let's make the initial contract time 12 hours, uh, the reciprocating party might reduce that by half to incentivize the initiating party to expose the secret. But as the market maker generally in our terms is party B, um, that party could also define and be pretty clear as to the contract terms saying, well, you as the initiating party need to lock your funds for a month and I will only lock mine for let's say three or four hours. If you make those kinds of things clear to the user, they are aware of the fact that there will be a strict penalty for them to back out of it. But that again moves the incentive over to the initiating party having the benefit in actually kind of denial of servicing at attack against uh, that collateral. Um, so essentially you can play around with those parameters, um, but you can also kind of manage the risk based off of seeing whether or not a transaction is submitted by the counterparty. As we know, uh, pulling out these secrets can be monitored by pure merit of just broadcasting the transaction. You don't actually have to wait for it. And then you can also make a call on whether or not the fee is going to be sufficient for it to clear within a certain amount of time. So it does come kind of, you've got the, you've got to trade off uh, some of those in terms of uh, right. the execution. Um, it sounds similar to like the Arwin trust model with, uh, you know, one party being this semi-trusted market maker. Uh, they're trusted not to DOS you, but uh, they're not. Um, but they're not trusted with custody of the funds. Depending, like for example, if um, in our case you automate the actual party B, the reciprocating party, it is important for them not to be the initiating party because through automation they could lock up those funds. So in terms of being a market maker in the system, you do build up a certain level of reputation. We can have a look at like the shape shifts, the change lease of the world, which has got this false perception that they're non-custodial, but they are actually custodial for the term of the swap because you are physically depositing funds with them. And then because of the duration of time that they take to pay you back, you, you kind of like are still relying on them to do that. Uh, so this is really to try and mitigate the high volume, low frequency swaps. It's definitely not at the stage where you want to do the high frequency swaps. Um, and as long as the users are made aware of these risks, as well as the terms of those swaps, uh, they seem to be generally happy. Cool, makes sense. I'll, I'll touch on quickly um, um, to add on to that kind of like some of the um, like the first funder problems that, um, you know, kind of get translated into like any any cross chain protocol, including anything that's working with debt specifically. Um, when we were uh, building atomic loans, um, we, we actually added a, a element of uh, what we call proof of funds, essentially, to avoid kind of the issue of, of griefing. So for example, like lenders, um, essentially, they lock their, you know, they lock their funds first. So a borrower comes along and they request a loan from a lender. Um, and if they lock it, well, the borrower could just run away and not uh, not do anything. So we get the borrower to actually prove that they have the funds necessary to actually um, do the loan by, you know, um, uh, signing basically a faulty transaction. Um, uh, and generally, like the kind of, uh, you know, this this first funder problem uh, and something like a, a debt agreement is, is, is mitigated a little bit more due to like the actual length um, of the actual agreement itself. Um, so for example, like kind of the intention of someone going to take out a loan is that I'm going to go and take out a loan for a longer period period of time. Um, and so generally, you know, you only need, um, as, as long as one person comes along and requests like, hey, I want a six month loan. Well, now that lender is actually making that return over the next six months. So it's a little bit less of a problem um, with longer debt agreements. Um, to touch on um, the earlier discussion on kind of the, the collateralization um, aspect. So for atomic loans, like we, we run into the kind of the same thing. Um, you know, you, all loans that you get in dire USDC are over collateralized by Bitcoin. 
Um, and we use a similar model to something like Compound or MakerDAO, where um, you know if if it goes to a minimum collateralization ratio of 140 percent. Um, you know, any third party liquidator can come in and, and liquidate that Bitcoin at a discount. Uh, now, it's a little bit different because um, of the cross chain aspect and, and waiting for Bitcoin block times. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so there is a, a little bit more of a, um, a, a waiting time or period for the, the liquidation to occur. Um, but it does use the, the basically the same, uh, uh, same mechanisms um, as the, those two for, for the liquidation process. How much extra time does it take? I mean, are the, are the liquidators taking on risk that? by the time this goes through a price crash is going to have caused them to actually make a lack of profit. Yeah. So essentially the, the liquidators themselves, uh, when they go in and actually liquidate a position, um, uh, so they can actually choose whether to actually, um, go through with the, the liquidation or refund. So that's why we always maintain basically a over collateralization of 140% because there's the case where the liquidator chooses not to claim. So in the case that the liquidator chooses not to, not to claim, uh, essentially another liquidation can occur um, afterwards, um, in which case, uh, so essentially the Bitcoin is moved, uh, is moved to basically the collateral swap position. Um, the liquidator can come in and, and basically claim that. If they choose not to claim it, they simply refund their existing um, uh, position, which is basically like an atomic swap. Um, and then in that case, another liquidator can come along and actually uh, claim that Bitcoin. Um, and so, uh, and that kind of mitigates some of the risks that a liquidator might run into. Uh, we set the discount at a 7% discount to mitigate some of those elements. Um, but yeah. Um, this sounds like the kind of risk that you could, you know, offset by having a account balances on multiple exchanges, right? Yeah, exactly. That as well. <laughs> uh, and, and also something that uh, for V2, that's, that's if you introduce the need to access, um, more centralized entities that allow you to take a short position on, on Bitcoin, right? So if you're trying to if you're trying to create an ecosystem where that's all that all doesn't exist, there is not really a way right now to take a short position on, on Bitcoin unless you have some off chain agreement that's peer to peer. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, what, what what yeah, sorry, go for it, James. We we, we did make some uh, like uh, HTLC based Bitcoin puts a while back, um, but I uh, couldn't get a lot of interest in them. Maybe, uh, maybe the, uh, the demand for liquidators here can, uh, can uh, revive that. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting because like HTLCs, you can't enter into the protocol atomically. Uh, so there's always this first funding problem and entering into the protocol has two confirmation cycles worth of latency to get it set up. Uh, you know, like one in a bit at best. Um, so you'd need to have these like puts in hand before liquidating essentially. Yeah. And if someone beats you to it, then you kind of screw. Yeah. Um, hedging all of this with, uh, like interchain latency and confirmation cycles is really difficult. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, wh one thing that's actually interesting there that can actually um, uh, reduce the amount of time for, for liquidators, um, I mean, a lot, a lot of these guys that are liquidating are, are essentially looking to buy Bitcoin cheap, but essentially like, um, you know, for a liquidator, you can actually use like, say, what James has built with the SPV proofs to, um, you know, for the liquidator to basically just get that Bitcoin directly, and then they can go and do a transaction on top of that to like send that directly to the exchange or wherever they want to um, exchange that Bitcoin directly to, to another asset. Um, and so that's, that's one aspect that, uh, that can kind of improve that as well. Um, I'm really interested to see like what kinds of hybrid protocols develop here. Um, we have a few like primitive tools for this, um, relays, SPV, HLCs, um, SMPC groups with bonds, that kind of thing. And we're just like starting to explore this protocol space. Yeah, I think that there is certainly a lot of interesting opportunity. We considered for a little while this idea that if your protocol looks like it's at risk of becoming under collateralized, you could take some of the locked assets and, for example, just move them into a time lock contract uh, for an extended period of time. And then you kind of have this time window to recover and get your, your bond value back. Obviously, this is, we, there's complexities here around you know, who's able to get funds back out of that locked contract. And if you're doing key rotation, how do you guarantee that that's actually claimable? Um, and then also there's this problem around um, essentially NPC run. <laughs> if people try to exit their, um, 
their Bitcoin from the system, and some of it, some some reasonable portion of it is is locked up in a um, a time lock contract. Then what do you do in that scenario? Um, but I, I agree with you, James. I think it's going to be interesting to see some of these primitives merge again. Like uh, for one, we went in the MPC direction because we felt like hash time lock contracts and all those things were ultimately inefficient. Uh, sorry, insufficient. Um, but I think I do think in the long term a combination of all of them is probably what we're going to see. Awesome. Um, great answers guys. And then, um, Matt and Alex, uh, I, I uh, this question is directed at you guys. Um, you guys face a bit more of an, a challenge in having to bootstrap liquidity rather than tapping into, you know, ready-made DeFi infrastructure, uh, on Ethereum when it comes to, you know, compound or Uniswap or what have you. It also sounds like it's a bit more technically challenging to be building on native Bitcoin versus, uh, you know, uh, versus bringing a, uh, versus bringing Bitcoin to, to ether. Um, why was it so essential to kind of like build a protocol that, uh, leverages native Bitcoin rather than, um, rather than, you know, building a tokenized version of Bitcoin? Yeah, so I think I think for us, like one of the elements there was actually uh, so in, in some aspects we are tapping into um, some of some of the DeFi infrastructure that's been built. So that's specifically on the lending side. So lenders that actually lend on atomic loans, their funds are actually lent out on compound and make the compound rate until they get pulled off and and enter into a debt agreement with a borrower. Um, so uh, so we're obviously taking advantage of that. But I think um, the element of uh, you know building natively on Bitcoin um, for us was was really providing an option for um, uh, for Bitcoiners that had a you know a very low um, amount of you know service area for attack. So like in, in general, like a lending protocol is only as strong as its weakest collateral. Um, and so for us, like that's you know that's native Bitcoin. Um, and so you know if you think of the surface area a uh, surface area of attacks for various um, you know uh, I think I think that to be honest a lot of a lot of Bitcoiners are a little wary of uh, of DeFi these days with the re recent uh, you know lend F me uh, craziness that occurred um, and so like you know one thing for us was like we really wanted to build something that had you know very very low uh, surface area for attack especially on the borrowing side when you're going and and locking your collateral um, and so I, I think that was one of the the main elements that was uh, was important for us obviously some of the trade-offs with that is that you need to build all this kind of infrastructure around around Bitcoin. So something like uh, TBDC or RenBTC, you know, can, you know, you, you already have MetaMask built for you. You already have, you know, Compound and, and MakerDAO that exists. Um, and so the challenge, a real, real challenge for us is, is kind of, uh, you know, building up that in the initial, in the initial ecosystem and, and getting people comfortable with like, you know, dealing with native Bitcoin and what is a Bitcoin script and how does, how does this work? Um, so I think that's, that's definitely going to be a, be a challenge for us uh, moving forward and just will require some, some education. Yeah, and I think on our side, it's it's pretty simple. One of the principles is we don't pay, build debt-based systems. Uh, in the event that you're wrapping something on another network, um, you're either indebted by the rules of those contracts, that network. Uh, we believe that there are already incentive mechanisms on each one of the individual networks. There are already security trade-offs on each one of those networks. Um, so at no point in time introduce another token or another ecosystem with a separate set of incentives into it and um, focus on, yeah, at no point in time should the user be indebted to something else. They should just always be in control. We're firm believers of a system of ownership over debt. Um, so uh, Matt, Matt brought up an interesting point of... Uh, you know, Ethereum has MetaMask and this ecosystem around it. Uh, and on the Bitcoin side, because scripts are complex, every time we want to do something that's, you know, slightly abnormal or slightly new, we essentially have to rebuild that ecosystem. Um, you need a custom signer and a custom transaction generator to make these custom scripts. Um, and a lot a lot of like what we've been doing for the last two years is trying to find the ideal form uh, of, for that ecosystem. Um, so the current, we, we maintain like extensive open source tooling for Bitcoin in Python, JavaScript, Rust, and other languages, uh, because we're trying to figure out like what is the right way to iterate on custom Bitcoin wallets 
And we've built a half dozen different wallets for different protocols over the years. The main like challenge that's prevented us from getting a product out there is that every time you want to do this, you have to build a new wallet for multiple assets, uh, essentially from scratch, and connect it to the existing ecosystem for those assets. And it's very difficult and time consuming, and there's not many good abstraction layers. Uh, one of the like cool things the quality has built is the chain abstraction layer to help solve this problem. But it's still you know, extremely difficult to build new wallets for every protocol you want to do. And then you have to onboard users into them. I think I think downloading specialized software or, or requiring your users to download specialized software and install it and maintain it and keep it up to date is like a larger challenge than I think is typically recognized. Um, we are uh, sorry. Um, I was our, really surprised by how to date our users' versions. Um, our like the main issue we had with cross chain swaps based on SPV stuff is that. In order to get one user, they had to have Bitcoin and Ether, download software, set up a new wallet, uh, so write down that 12-word phrase, uh, then move their Bitcoin and their Ether into that new wallet. Uh, and so you've gone through like this seven-step process where users fall out of every step. And by the end of it, there's only like five people left. Um, so our like main focus for the last year has been getting Bitcoin into web browsers. Uh, so we have a bunch of Rust Bitcoin uh, with WASM bindings that's coming out pretty soon that we're really excited about. Uh, because it's so much easier to get users to go to a web page than to download software. I think um, this is a, we had the exact same pain when we were working with Atomic Swaps initially. Um, and it's something that I guess has instructed the current design of RenVM. Um, the anticipation being that whenever you interact with Bitcoin and you're interacting via RenVM, you are interacting with Bitcoin. Um, at no point as a user are you interacting with a wrapped version of this token. So you don't have this ERC20 representation sitting in your MetaMask wallet. You have it sitting in your Bitcoin wallet. So if you want to take out a loan and you want to collateralize it with Bitcoin or you want to fund an automated market making bot or you want to extract your funds from an automated market making bot all of this should happen through the native currencies that you're working with um because it's just if you're a bitcoin user or if you have bitcoin and you want to work with bitcoin you shouldn't have to also have eth um just to pay for gas as an example or have to have metamask just to make a transaction even though you're trying to work with bitcoin um and i think this gets this problem gets worse once you start considering multi-asset multi-chain where you want to maybe bounce different types of assets through multiple chains, this starts compounding and suddenly you're in a situation where you have a user that has to make a dozen transactions through a dozen different wallets with a dozen different gas tokens. And this is obviously just never going to happen. So that's something we've tried to focus on. And, and it kind of ties back to, um, I guess, Alex's point, which is that, and obviously this is not, um, it's not a perfect solution, but it helps to minimize how long your Bitcoin is away from home. Unless your Bitcoin's actually actively being used for something on chain, it's not just going to be sitting there inside a MetaMask wallet waiting to be used. It's going to come back off that chain and live back on the Bitcoin uh, chain where it's the safest. Because no matter what interoperability solution you work with, even if the interoperability layer is somehow perfect, you're always compounding risk. Because you've got the Bitcoin risk and then you've got the Ethereum risk if you, that's where it's living. And you're just always going to be exposed to both of those. And that's assuming you have a perfect interoperability layer which really just doesn't exist. Awesome, guys. Well, uh, we're reaching the end of the panel. Um, so uh, just to wrap up really quick, guys, um, maybe we can go around uh, the table and then basically um, say, one, what's one prediction that you have for, uh, for DeFi or the next, uh, next year? Um, and then uh, where can we go to learn more about uh, your respective projects? Uh, sorry, yeah. starting with Long. All right. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of Bitcoin assets in DeFi over the next year. Um, WBTC, IMBTC, TBTC, PBTC, RenBTC. Um, and I think we're going to see abstractions that kind of bundle those all the way. And I think that's really good. Um, it was mentioned a couple of times that one thing about why you need over collateralization is because you don't have anyone to sue. I think 
systems like IMBTC and WBTC are actually helpful for institutions that need somebody to sue because that's how they know how to operate. Um, and also it's great that all of these different systems, you know, you've got TBTC, which can fail under bad liquidation mechanisms. You've got RenBTC, which can fail under bad governance mechanisms. You've got, you know, WBTC, which can fail under custodian mechanisms. They all fail differently. And I think that's important. And they all give users choice, which is ultimately what decentralization is about the choice to take on risk yourself. Um, so I think that's really good. I think we'll see that coming into the DeFi ecosystem and we'll be seeing these pools of assets that are essentially the same asset. Um, and we're already sort of seeing this with stablecoins. So I think we'll continue to see more of that with Bitcoin. Um, as far as people who want to come learn about Ren, um, come join our Telegram. That's m m where most of the chat happens. Ren Project is the name of the chat. Come check it out. Uh, we're also on Reddit and, and Twitter. Awesome. Uh, Alex? Yeah, sure, man. Um, not too good on predictions, uh, but something we definitely push for is this intermediated finance. Um, decentralization is fine, but if you're going to decentralize intermediaries, we don't really see any point in that. So we hope uh, this intermediated finance becomes a thing. And then, uh, yeah, if you want to get a hold of us, uh, you can go out to liquidity.io. Uh, on that page, you'll be able to gain access to our Twitter as well as our Telegram channels. We also have quite an active Telegram uh, group going on. And yeah, feel free to ping us if you have any questions. Awesome. Uh, James? Uh, let's see. One prediction for DeFi this year. Um, personal tokens are going to continue to be a nothing burger. Uh, like they have for the last six years. Um, that That's my prediction. Um, in order to like learn more about SUMA, check out our website. It's SUMA.one, O-N-E. Um, but really, like, go to GitHub and read the code. It's github.com slash SUMA-TX. Um, if you want spicy takes, follow me on Twitter. Uh, that's at underscore Prestwitch. Cool. Yeah. And I, I guess I'll, I'll finish it off here for, uh, I guess my prediction is I think like what's really interesting about all the projects that we're making is kind of like for the first time, um, you know, Bitcoin financial tools don't need to be on a, on a centralized exchange or don't need to be centralized. And so I think we're, for the first time ever, we're going to see, you know, Bitcoiners that have never, you know, touched DeFi before. Um, you know, actually, you know, coming in and, and testing out some of these tools and, and seeing what is possible, um, you know, off of, uh, you know, outside of, uh, of kind of centralized financial tools that exist today. So uh, I think that would be my, my, my prediction. Um, for Atomic Loans, you can, you can check it out on our website, uh, atomic.loans, or, uh, or we're active on Telegram as well. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. It was a great, great panel. And uh, we'll see everyone hopefully uh, soon in person when this is all over. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. It was, was good.